Good evening, everyone. It is now 6.43 p.m. on Monday, August 22nd, 2022. And this is the City Council Work Session. And, uh, we have a few items we'll be discussing shortly, but uh, for now, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Patty, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Frank Banker. Present. Councilmember Leslie Notero. Here. Councilmember Lloyd Roberts. Here. Councilmember Jody Shirley. Here. Councilmember Mike Zabel. Here. Vice Mayor Glenn Gunn. Here. Mayor Dave Gaddis. Here. Interim City Manager Kyle Riefler. Here. And City Attorney Randy Mora. Present. Thank you, Patty. All right, uh, the first item on the agenda is to discuss the contract for code enforcement services with Pinellas County Sheriff for fiscal year 2022-2023. Um, what's missing is who put this on the agenda. I'm assuming that it was uh, Aram City Manager Riddler? Yes. That's All right. right, you've got the floor. Okay, so this is an overview. Um, this came up in the uh, June uh, council meeting and we decided that we were going to table it to discuss further. Uh, we've been doing code enforcement with the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office since 2020. Uh, last year we had code enforcement budgeted for 20 hours a week at a rate of $49.80. Uh, this year that, that rate went up 4.01%. Uh, now the rate is $51.80 per hour. We've discussed in previous meetings of cutting back the 20 hours a week down to 15 hours a week. Um, if you take our, what we budgeted uh, 20 hours a week at the new rate would be $53,872 for the year. Uh, if we drop it back down to 15 hours a week, it's uh, $40,404. Um, that's a difference of $13,468. Keep in mind that in the uh, non-departmental budget, we have a uh, part-time administrative assistant added to the budget. That is a 20-hour part-time position at $18 an hour. That is gonna cost the city, once hired, $18,720. So it'll kind of offset uh, by cutting back the hours on the code enforcement. I calculated a 12-hour week of code enforcement will take us down to an annual cost of $32,323, which would give us a difference of our current 20-hour week of $21,548. So at that point, we'd be completely covering this part-time admin assistance. Um, and saving the city of uh, roughly $3,000. I think that's kind of our magic number to get to, is a three-day, maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, four-hour shift for Pinellas County Sheriff Code Enforcement as a hybrid model with using Laura, who would be our in-house staff, to do some of the code enforcement procedures. Um, but immediately what I'm recommending is that we go to a 15-hour week and see how that goes. So that would be a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, five hour shift. All right. Mike Zabel, do you have any questions? Um, actually, I'm um, fine for the 15, I'm rolling it back to the uh, 15 hours because right now, just looking at the last few months, um, it's going out and obviously talking to people and always looking, you know, where's your license, where's your permit, but um, it really, you haven't seen a, a big, you know, sweeping increase in violations, so 15 hours is, is fine for me, going back to that. Lloyd? I concur with the 15. The only question I would have, Kyle, is how does that work with the sheriff department? So five hours with us, what does that person do for the balance? Do they typically, what's their shift normally? Is it 
is it whatever we want it to be, or do they have other time that they spend for the county no. or the sheriff somewhere else? So they just go home after five hours, and that's, that's it. They're good with that. Yes. Okay. And um, the way our contract works, and I've talked to the captain, you know, it, it, it's completely up to, up to us. We want to do five hours a week. We can do five hours a week. Okay. They're, they're at our service. Um, they'll be happy to provide any code enforcement requirement that we have. Um, so it is completely up to us to determine what the hours are going to be and how we schedule those hours. Perfect. So whoever is in that position, they're not working like 40 hours a week for the sheriff. And out of that 40 hours, in this example, they're working 15 hours for us, and then 25 hours that the sheriff finds other things for that person to do. That's the sheriff the finds other duties for them. Oh, the sheriff would. So they, the sheriff, yeah. they don't just work. 15 hours a week is like a part-time. They don't solely do our city. Um, they find other hours throughout the county. Okay. Yeah. So that works for them. Yes. Good. Frank Baker. I'm good with the 15 hours. It's an experiment. All right. Leslie? Um, I'm just trying to find in here where the 20 hours or the 15 hours are not specified in the contract. They aren't. That's just a, um, let's see, hours as... That's determined by the determined city Determined by his or her supervisor after consultation with the city manager. Yes. Okay. I have no problem with that. So I'm, I don't, I'm not a fan of cutting back hours uh, when it comes to code enforcement. Clearly we just had a meeting where we had three major violations and I think maybe if we had someone working on it more, you know, it wasn't treated as a part-time job and a no one took ownership type of position, we maybe wouldn't have those, those code issues piling up. I'm not going to say that we could have made, done anything different. I'm just an observation. I know there's a lot of code issues throughout the town. Um, I see them quite often. Whether they're addressed or not, I don't know. Um, I certainly don't call a code enforcement officer on everything I see. So I, you know, if it affects me directly, I might call, but certainly I don't call. So I don't know that um, I'm in favor of reducing the hours. I know administratively the staff in the office needs assistance. I'm not against hiring an administrative assistant, but I might be against reducing the hours for the code enforcement officer, giving you, you know, the budget to do both. Thank you. Blame God. What I haven't heard here is everybody's jumping on, okay, let's go from 20 to 15 hours. What I haven't heard is what falls off the plate, what's not going to get done, or what's still going to get done and get emphasized, okay? So we haven't really gone over what those duties are, what, okay, we're going to cross off five hours worth of duties, well, what are those things that are going to fall off the plate and what stays on them? This admin assistant was kind of like slipped in it was during the budget briefings and there was really no discussion or description of what those duties were and what that person does and what the, the, the costs are going to be. Uh, I'd like to see a little more requirements based decision making here. If we go from 20 hours to 15 hours, how do you know if it's gotten better? How will you know if it's gotten better? Just bottom line is cheaper, but I mean, how do you know that you're still getting those things done that are important to the residents with code enforcement and to the staff, and we're going to see a reduction in the problems we're having with code enforcement. So answer me those questions about the duties and responsibilities that are going to change, and uh, how we're going to know and monitor it if it's getting better or if it's getting worse. Give me those details, and I'm willing to help make a decision there. Just not in favor to say, yeah, we want for 20 hours to 15 hours. Okay, uh, let me see if I remember how this went. This contract is not determining the number of hours. This is just engaging with the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department. Uh, so, I, yeah, although it's important to discuss who's going to do what, um, we need to get this thing signed and get it back to them or terminate we terminate services for code enforcement and bring it all back in the house. There's no, I don't see any middle of the road on this. It, 
it's, it's either we, we engage or we don't engage if we decide to use internal personnel uh, as a, a supplement to code enforcement services provided by the Sheriff's Department. Uh, so be it, but I don't think it's relevant to this contract. I, uh, I agree with right the contract, and frankly, I would recommend that we approve it, with the exception of being page 4 of 6, that we change uh, city manager name to the acting city manager, Kyle. Uh, what this contract does give us the opportunity is it provides a max, a ceiling cap, uh, not to exceed fifty-four thousand uh, dollars, and it's up to the city manager, as designated by the city council, how many hours and what to spend. So I would recommend that we approve this contract. Thank you, Lloyd Roberts. Agreed. Frank, I uh, agree on that. On Mr. Dunn's question, aren't most violations or a question of violations given to the city manager yourself and then dispatch to the code enforcement person. So what I'm saying is so you have a pretty good idea that we can reduce the hours or that's that's the way Lynn always told me how it works. I have a good understanding of the workflow. A lot of the a lot of the complaints do come through with me and then I give them to the code enforcement officer, but most of them that come directly through him I'm aware of because he I'll see these checks in on a daily basis. So I know he's working on it. Right. Leslie? Yeah. Like somebody said, this agreement doesn't say anything about the number of hours, whether we're doing 15 hours or 20 hours. These numbers are determined by the supervisor and the city manager. So I think that gives us the leeway that we need to have effective um, code enforcement. Jody? I would agree with that. Just I know, and we've talked about this before, before is what we, you know, what's the plan moving forward? Because we are in a work session, we can talk about it. Um, moving forward to set some um, standards, you know, how are we going to grade, how are we going with code enforcement? Well, um, Glenn's brought that up several times. I think I've shared with Adam some things that have been supplied to me years ago that seem, I'm not sure to put that together for sure, but it seemed like a pretty good basis of here's the flow of how it works and here's whose responsibilities but then we can maybe start with something like that and start putting forward expectations and how are we doing like you know can we go back to the residents and say we're making a dent in the code enforcement issues um, you know I don't know I, I don't know if we are or not I mean I guess it just depends on what resident you talk to and how they're affected by Code violations. I personally don't think we do a great job following up on stuff. Glenn, All right. Uh, I, I will admit that, um, that there are many people throughout the community that are unhappy with the services provided by the sheriff's department. Uh, but for the most part, it's people that were either caught with their pants down or were, um, didn't uh, like the approach. Um, there, there's uh, someone here in the audience who actually has uh, spoken to me about it. I think that there may be some uh, conversations that need to be have, had about how to address uh, the residents whenever there's a problem and what you can and can't do. Um, I, Firmly believe that um, Deputy Clapp is doing, he's going by the book and he's doing everything right. Unfortunately, we're not, I don't think we're used to right. Uh, it's, and so it's it's a, a little bit of a, an abrasive experience to the little town of Bel Air Beach. So maybe that's something uh, that we can work on in the future uh, just to make this a little less than what it has been for certain people. Uh, that's why I added item number four about what can you do, what what can't you do, and how do we address this and, and uh, educate the, the residents so they don't have this terrible experience whenever they uh, decide to tape up all their windows and act like nothing's going on. So, uh, other than that, I'm, uh, I agree with you. Definitely do a better job of monitoring our progress. However, I kind of feel that on all of these constructions.
construction projects that are uh, that are uh, illegal, unlicensed, unpermitted. They're going to gradually go down. But if we ever terminated services with Deputy Clapka, they would go right back up because now no one's watching. So I, I, I've been watching the, the uh, I've been watching the uh, citations and uh, the investigations. For the most part, most of them were warranted. Again, I think that there's a certain way that you handle people in Bel Air Beach whenever you want to approach them, and that's probably something that we could do a little better job of. Um, but I say we move forward um, and get this contract signed and move on. Okay. Agree? Yep, agree. Yes. Any other discussion on this topic? Can we have some, how are we moving forward with code enforcement? Can we, since we're on a work session, can we have, I mean, I don't mean to be, and I kind of disagree with you, I don't think the sheriff's talking about my residents, but that's just my opinion, I mean, when I've seen it, so I'll just say. That's why we're here, so, yeah. so please. But, but I mean, you know, can we put this on a timeline of, you know, what are, what are our expectations, and let's, let's not, kick it down the road again, because I think every, we've talked about this, I think since all of us started with the receipts, that we need to have some measurable um, <clears throat> plan. Are we doing better, or are we not? Are, you know, and, and so, and let's, you know, let's talk about that. Who can head that up, Kyle, and, you know? All the data is out there. We've all received the reports every month. All we have to do is compile the data and show trends. Shouldn't, really shouldn't be that hard, uh, but I, I still firmly believe that with uh, with Deputy Clapka, we're going to see the a lot of the calls going down, and then the ones that are not hot hot bed items for him. Uh, he, he seems to be attracted to the uh, construction projects and doing things without permits, um, and then the rest of it I think is directed based. Would you agree with that? I would agree. Okay. And so, if we're steering the directive, then how do you know if you're actually doing better or not? The directive would have to be the same at all times to even be able to monitor a trend. I, I think you would have to, uh, I don't know, this week we go for hedges, next week you go for grass. You know, I'm just not real sure what the best way to monitor this other than look back on our history and once we have that uh, maybe we can sit down and try to say these things are very important to us and these are the ones that we really want to focus on and give that information back to uh, Deputy Clapton and you uh, uh, Kyle you uh, had it in your plans that you were going to use your staff to do some of the code enforcement. Uh, and it, I don't know if it was this, it, it wouldn't be like what Dan P. Clapp is doing. It would be more soft targets. Is that right? That's correct. I think more just general monitoring, going up and down the streets, looking at the lots, picking out the obvious um, when it comes to landscape grass um, and you know parking issues. Um, that, that kind of thing, I think, uh, piece of time can be set aside for the staff in-house to, to cover that. Um, Deputy Clapp uh, does focus a lot on construction. Uh, he seems to catch a lot of things that aren't going, the, the people who, who aren't licensed, who aren't permitted. Um, so I think that is vital. Um, and uh, he has a presence of kind of coming up on a, on a property and, and, and getting answers. Um, without people giving them a run around too much, he gets to the bottom of it. So he definitely is making an impact on license, uh, people being licensed and proper permitting. Um, so I think there needs to be a balance. Uh, I've I got to kind of find out all the areas that we need to focus on, what's most important, and then i got to divide up how we're going to allocate people's time to that in a given week and, and come up with more of a, a plan on a weekly basis so that 
the directive and then find a way to measure it. The way I approach it. So is it fair to say that's something you'll work on and you can come back to us with a plan? That's what sure. we're looking for. I don't I don't think we're gonna solve the problem right now. I swear. To to Joby's point here, code enforcement is a process from an organizational standpoint, code enforcement is a process that runs through every priority in the strategic plan. It's a process code enforcement, it runs through safety and health of our residents, it runs through the best taxpayer return for our tax dollar, it runs through community and aesthetics and communications, it runs through <coughs> everything. So it's an important process for this city, and I'm not sure, or, or to Jody's point, it needs its due regard here. It needs an owner. Somebody needs to own it. Somebody needs to take it by the horns and say, okay, this is this is the code enforcement process of policy. This is how we're going to staff it. This is how we're going to fund it. This is what the responsibilities are. This is how we're going to measure it and tell us whether we're getting better or worse. It, it's, it, it's too important to just say, okay, we, we've got codes. We've got a guy who goes out and writes citations. We've got somebody driving around. It's more important than that. It needs structure. And we don't have that structure. And we really need to set the direction for this thing. It's that important. It's really that important. Every city knows that. Code enforcement is an important process for a city. And we need to get a little more structure than just say, yeah, we've got codes. We've got a guy with a bed walking around. And I agree with you. It's, uh We've been talking about this for what, five or six years now, and really the method of doing it has not changed. Um, people complain, it's landscape calls, and then suddenly it becomes a directive. Once we run these calls for a while, uh, but there's not been a systematic approach where it sort of uh, is uh, on autopilot, which I think would probably be uh, an important matter because we do see these lawns that are completely trashed. Why are they being ignored? I can tell you why. Because their neighbor is not complaining. It's it's the it's the squeaky wheel situation. It's <clears throat> generally how we handle code enforcement. Kyle, please speak up if I'm incorrect. You're completely, <clears throat> completely correct. It's definitely a reactive process. I think to, to add to that matter, if I may, with the recent changes in the statute in the last two years, we've gone from a system where um, complaints could be made anonymously to a system where they cannot, which in some communities we've seen, not, I wouldn't necessarily call it a full-on chilling effect, but a hesitancy. Uh, as a good neighbor to not be the person, hey, I know you were traveling and I didn't want to call, but honestly, man, can you handle it? And yes, that gets back to people having a discourse, but um, for, the, for, for the passerby who drives down the street every now and again, seeing that and saying, nobody's doing anything about this. Um, well, it is often complaint-based, and those can, if you have a discomfort about making the complaint, then it doesn't get handled. Uh, I would say the other part of that is, um, and I know you and I have spoken about this, and myself and the manager, the interim manager have spoken about this as well, but also your due process, process for code enforcement. You and I can see um, something that we know to be or believe to be a violation, but that person is going to get a hearing date. Um, that hearing date might be three weeks out, and at that hearing, they're going to determine whether or not they were in violation, and then give additional time to come into compliance. And so somebody keeps driving by week after week and saying, I told the city about it, they didn't do anything. Well, we've set a hearing, and we'll have another hearing after that, maybe, if they don't comply. Um, and, and then the, the last thing I think that's an important consideration for our policymakers when we're talking about code enforcement is understanding that as it is a priority towards your strategic plans and initiatives, it's also not a profit venture. Um, it, 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 and many times can be done at a loss, depending on how it's done, um, because you're not, you're, not, you're not making money on it. You're doing it to get compliance. And in some cases, in most cases, it should be at a loss. You go out there and you say, hey, turn down the music. All right, turn down the music. There's nobody getting a violation for that. You might get upset about it because it woke you up. Um, but you got compliance. And the same is true of landscaping and other issues. So those are some of the challenges you see as the, as the for lack of a better term, the casual passerby in a community, so it may seem like nothing's being done when, hey, it's accruing a fine on a daily basis. That's, we don't have the right to enter into private property and just make it 
look like the HOA we desire. Um, we have the ability to impose that fine, maybe foreclose on it if we're at that stage, but there are limits even to the city's ability to, to reach the aesthetic goals or just general safety goals that we want. Thank you. Glenn, go ahead. The cost benefits to the city are a subtle thing. People move to Bellier Beach because they like the way the neighborhoods look. They look, they like the feel of the community, and the foundation and baseline for that are a system of codes and code enforcement, right? When, when, when you can't get along with your neighbor or whatever, the common denominator is the codes. That's the basis for how we expect to conduct our relations with our residents and, and our neighbors. So. When we enforce these codes, I mean, that's kind of the expectation of people who live here because they moved here because they like the way the place looks, the way it feels. And that's the subtle thing that drives up property values. So, yeah, it, there's, it's not a revenue stream by any mean, but in a subtle way, that's what increases the property values of Bellar Beach. And guess what happens to that? Add the law. So it's, it's a very subtle thing, but it's, it, it is a, a double-edged sword. Can I just add, it's not just um, someone's lawn being up front. There's life safety issues on my street. I pay to have pest control and, and mosquito repellent spray every couple of weeks. The guy next to me has a green pool that when I finally called code enforcement, he said, I don't care if he knows I called. I'm tired of paying to kill his mosquitoes. He's growing in his pool, and by the way, there's appliances and things like that. Um, they drain the pool. Well, that draining the pool works until it rains, and the water comes right back. So I don't know what kind of follow-ups done on something like that, but I can just tell you I see rats running. I've in three occasions over the last week seen rats running across the road. I'm walking the dog at night. And all of that stems from that house not being maintained. I mean, it all goes hand in hand. My point is, we're really looking at life safety issues. And so there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into this. And I don't know how you overcome that example I just gave, but he was in his backyard and no one knows that what's going on back there. But just, a, you know, for instance, things that we need to be on the lookout for. Until a few years ago, we used to have a code enforcement officer on staff. We didn't use the sheriff's department. We had our own code enforcement officer. And then there were some um, personnel issues that went out, so we got rid of that person, and that's when we got the contract with the sheriff. Do we want to go back to having someone on the staff that is a full-time code enforcement officer? Something to think about. Right. I'm all in favor of keeping the uh, sheriff as a code enforcement officer. I think uh, satisfy Councilman Shirley uh, concerns about where we lose him for five hours. Maybe Kyle, you can delegate the easy stuff, like you said, to our in-house people and have him do more patrolling than you know answering simple complaints on one. I, I don't think he answers that many long complaints now, does he? Doesn't our in-house do that? No. I probably done about seven of them last month. Okay. So, yeah. so I try to grab them. Okay. All right. But I just think you should be on the street patrolling more than answering little little problems. But I, I like to keep it. I like to keep it sure. Boy. So has anybody other than Leslie actually lived through here? You know, working on the council that saw both in-house versus Austin. So what would, what would the, just the gut feelings of back, back then when it was within the city staff, did you guys feel like it was better then than it is with the sheriff? Not any particulars, but just gut feeling. Did it seem like, you know, I don't know what the criteria you would use to evaluate that question. One of the things that having the sheriff comes is they look more serious than, <laughs> Yeah, they've, right. got, they've got a uniform on, and they can. Um, but the end result, you know, yeah. again, we haven't identified the criteria right. to how to evaluate that. I think this is Glenn's point. I think Danny said it best. 
previous Special Forces officer, but I go out, and he was a very great guy. He was very mild mannered and everything like that. When he went out to investigate, if he thought he was being lied to, he would say, I'm going to stop this interview and now make it an official interview with a police officer with you, which if I catch your line, could be a two year felony charge. So then all of a sudden, you can say the stories would change and you get the truth. I don't think we get the same type of service we have in the house. It seems like the, the flow of the information, though, <clears throat> went better or could go better with the internal staff because possibly one person was working it all the way through, whereas my understanding is now the sheriff and his deputy who does a great job identifies the issue, comes back, turns in a document to somebody else, that somebody else takes it and fills out some more information. And by the time the report is generated, more than a couple of people have touched it. I think that lends itself to some challenges where one person was in concert the whole way through the process. There's less likelihood of something falling through the cracks, just my opinion. Real quick, when I was with IBM, we used to do a thing called an application transfer study our customers, it would take six weeks. So you could take a topic like code enforcement and work with that company for that entire period to develop all the things like Vice Mayor Gunn was talking about. So at the end of the day, and you took everything from scratch. Nothing was assumed the way we used to do it. They didn't care how they used to do it. And you actually came out with a whole new process and program, taking this as an example with uh, code enforcement. So then everybody, now that, that could be done mainly from the city staff, although we don't have a big staff. Um, we, the companies that we work with could have had you know, 500 employees and we would take 50 key staff from that organization to develop new processes and programs. But it's not something that's done in an hour meeting, I can tell you that. You know, it takes, it takes, you know for, for this one topic, if you're trying to do it in an entire weekend, eight hours Saturday and an eight hours Sunday, it would be tough. But at the end of the day, with everybody's effort, you came out of there with a document saying, this is how we're doing it, and this is why we're doing it. So, just a thought. Thank I'm you. retired, so I have plenty of time. I'm sorry. It's an important issue, but I just want to bring us back on topic. I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, interim city manager to execute contract for code enforcement services with Pinellas County Sheriff for fiscal year 22-23. I don't think we can do that. And this is just general yeah. consensus direction and we're at a work session. Maybe if you're on a consent, consent agenda item at a later meeting or otherwise. But I okay. I appreciate your input. But otherwise, <laughs> I'd like to move on because uh, looking at the uh, last uh, agenda we had from Monday, August 15th, we still have the beautification program, Gulf Boulevard, smoking on the beach, rules for painting and doing yourself or some general business. So we still got quite a lot on the schedule. Jody Shirley, uh, this, our conversation was at. I'd like to nominate Roy the work <laughs> in terms of city manager to get this process going. And Shabbat, are you interested in taking all this sure. project? Sure. Mm -hmm. that? Give up your yeah. softball time? Sure. Give up softball time. All right. Don't so uh, whenever you do have something put together, uh, <clears throat> please spread it out. And, uh, We'll, uh, we'll respond individually. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Lloyd. All right. Uh, next up, the Gulf Boulevard Beautification Project Undergrounding Funding Report. This also is a term city manager report. Thank okay, you. for this, we got a, a slideshow presentation. Um, you should all have this packet from me in, along with this couple of things. I set it out on uh, it was Thursday evening, so hopefully you have some time to take a look at it.
Yeah, I should have it right now where people at home can see it as well. Oh. Okay, first we're going to start off with a map, a little explanation of where we're at and where we're going. Um, currently we are 95% done with phase zero, as we call it, which is going to be the west side of Gulf Boulevard um, and the uh, crosswires. But whatever the, the street. It's down to a, a handful of uh, die wires that are in the process of getting removed. Moving forward, we're looking to start on the south side of the city, which is phase one. Uh, that comes in with the uh, cost of utility consultants and deep energy, uh, about two million dollars. Phase two, so that's from that's from the uh, first street to Cosmic Boulevard. Phase two will be north of Cosmic Boulevard. Um, same thing, it's going to be utility consultants doing the uh, conduit and followed by Duke Energy. And we also have some uh, spectrum off the do on the north part of the city. Uh, that is from Troll Street Park. So combined, if we were to consolidate phase one and phase two, we're looking at about $5.3 million total. Um, in the grand scheme of thing, if we press it out, it saves us about 20 to 25K with uh, utility consultants, uh, which would be a mobilization fee um, savings. So um, we compared that to the incoming money from Penny for Pinellas. Um, if you look at the middle table there on the slide on, the, uh, it shows that uh, we're currently budget available to start in fiscal year 23. We're at about $2.2 million available. Um, if you look at the phase one number, that, that gives us enough to start phase one, both the utility consultants and the Duke energy portions. Um, and with a little left over of 200k. Um, for fiscal year 24, we have pending money available, which is about 930,000, and the same is true for fiscal year 25. Um, if you look at the big picture, it puts us at, uh, for the total project, at, in the hole for about $1.2 million. So we at this point, you need to find alternate funding sources um, unless in Penny 5 program they come up with more money for the underground projects. That has not been determined. So, in looking at this slide, we've kind of said, uh, you know, some options. We have a million dollar hurricane fund that we maintain. And one option would be to downsize the restricted uh, hurricane fund to uh, $400,000, uh, giving us a freeing up of $600,000. Uh, at the same time, looking into opening a line of credit um, to compensate for that. And then we also want to remember that we have the uh, American Rescue Funds, which is about $802,000. Um, so that, in turn, give us about $1.4 million. Um, that could be used to compensate our, uh, our losses uh, or where we need to get the funding from. If we go to the next page, we got the timeline. Um, this timeline, uh, right now we're, uh, you know, we're at the end of the uh, fiscal year 22 uh, work session discuss discussing uh, our options here. Um, First piece of pie is we want to get uh, phase one started. So the intention is to have this on the September regular meeting agenda to move forward uh, to get phase one started, uh, to give contracts to the utility consultant and Duke Energy. Uh, we have the money available right now. Uh, it's something that we should get going. There's a lot of cities up and down Gulf Boulevard that are doing underground as well. And um, this is 
the intention of the previous manager as well um, to, to start phase one. Uh, the important, important uh, timeline uh, date would be in beginning of November. Now, because if we're considering doing uh, consolidating both phase one and phase two, um, it's important to know that Duke Energy, both phase one and phase two, the mining cost estimates um, expire on uh, December 8th, 2022. So, given enough time, we need to make a decision on phase two uh, in the November meeting. And also, uh, something to look at, if you look at the timeline of phase one, you have utility consultants coming in, their timeline is actually four to five months for that, for that phase. Uh, after they complete that, Duke needs to come in, they need to inspect their work, and then they start their portion. Uh, Duke Energy for phase one is looking at about 10 months, so these are conservative uh, times. It could be shorter, but still, um, if we plan to do phase one starting this kind of budget year, and then with a the conservative thought of not starting phase two until we got more money than else money, uh, which would be the starting fiscal year 24, you see phase two, it stretches this out. Um, same deal, four to five months until the consultants are due coming in for the larger portion of phase two in about 12 months. Um, the idea of consolidation, utility consultants um, brings them back down to doing both phase one and phase two to about five to seven months, and then do come in afterwards, um, almost overlapping because utility consultants are doing the phase ones south of Causal Boulevard, at that point you can move into your inspections and start the work while the utility consultants start phase two. And then utility consultants fill it, finish this county in phase two. Duke Energy is now up and down Gulf Boulevard, wrapping up their portions. The idea of giving more time to Duke Energy to get, not get started on the work earlier is in hopes that they get multi-crews out here. Um, timeline projections are based on having one crew working, but more time available, they might get overlap. Um, that's why we kind of represented in the orange here um, possible savings in time. That uh, with the goal of trying to keep it a two year project to get this all complete. Um, another good reason that we have uh, decision making for phase two consolidation in November is that. It gives us some time to take it back to the Citizens Advisory Board, get some advice, um, and also a uh, new city manager gives a, some time to do a sanity check. Check our, check our projects. Um, next page. We did some calculations. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, and I'm sorry so late for this question, but if you go back to the second page, I guess, which was phase zero, phase one, phase two. Some of the numbers that I just was having trouble, that's the one. So if we look at FY24, and we say that the projected cost is 3,400,000 and change, and then the pennies grant, 930,000, obviously that's revenue coming in, and then we had an extra $261,000 left over that we brought over from 23. I'm having difficulty coming up with that one million two hundred seventy-seven thousand eight hundred seventy-four dollars being the delta. So we have we have a cost of three million four hundred thousand, and then we have revenues of nine hundred thirty thousand and two hundred sixty-one thousand coming into there, right? The delta is, is uh, much bigger than that. Nine hundred thirty thousand. That's the other column there. It's the third penny length. Taking into account the next year, how your money is not lined up. Yeah, it's 930 twice, so you're. you're oh, it's 930 twice. Yeah, your delta, the way the table's laid out, if you take all the orange portion, uh -huh. um, so you're taking both both years of the 9, 930, plus the extra, subtracting from the uh, 3,400, so that's where you're getting that number. And if you bring it all the way over, we have the uh, one million two thousand two hundred thousand fifty-two. That's that's taking into account the uh, 
a 25,000 meter stage. Right, but even that one doesn't. So if you look at the, but but you're not showing the 930 twice, really, in that particular right. column. It's two scenarios, right? Yeah. So the takeaway from here was just that the overall project we're we're looking at needing to find funding at 1.2 million dollars. So we have a deficit of 1.2 million for yes. both projects, right? But the nine hundred and thirty thousand dollars we're getting in twenty three and twenty four, correct. Right. But we don't show it in twenty three. It's just sprayed right out. We've already got it in twenty three. We're going to get twenty four, and then once you get the pennies money for twenty four, like that's going to basically go backwards to pay for the project you're doing just in twenty four. Mm -hmm. six. And it's important to know that um, this money is just becoming available. We still have the budget it up front. Yeah, we're it's right. we're here. Okay. Please continue. So, on this page, I uh, did a uh, calculation of where we're at with our unassigned reserves at the start of fiscal year 23, which is going to be this October. Uh, we're looking at about 2.5, 2.6 rounded um, million dollars in reserve unassigned funds. Um, our charter requires us to have 20% of our operating expenditures. That's uh, 563,000 roughly. Um, and I'm calculating uh, based on a model that was a a very conservative model. Uh, what we did is we kept our ad valorem <coughs> income the same. We increased our expenditures throughout each year at 8.5%. So that'd be basically keeping the same inflation rate ongoing for the next two years. Um, and then if we kept it doing that way, it leaves us with in the beginning of fiscal year 2024, uh, $2.2 million in unrestricted, and then in the beginning of 2025, $1.5. Now, also, it's important to know that this does not include the, the American Rescue funding. So, if you took that American Rescue uh, injection, uh, it brings us back up to roughly about $2.3. Um, let's talk about the poles themselves and the aesthetics of, of Gulf Boulevard. Um, as you know, you know, we have the poles that are still left on the east side. Uh, we have yet the high tension power lines that are at the top of the poles. They're probably the most uh, significant thing left over if you're driving down the road. Uh, we have street lights that are on most of the poles. Now, during this project and undergrounding the, the wires, we have a total of 82 poles left on uh, Gulf Boulevard. Now, 67 of those actually have lights on them, so there's only 15 poles that will be removed during this project. So, aesthetically, you're going to get rid of those top power lines, they're going to cut them and cap them. And it's going to leave us um, with 67 streetlights on the east side still. Some issues and uh, issues or non-issues, just general considerations. I think of, um, like that previous slide is the, uh, the safety, the resiliency versus the aesthetics. Um, what, what we're trying to accomplish with this project, and, and at what point, uh, you know. It, 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 we're seeing a significant increase in, in the looks of driving up and down Bell Boulevard as you go through Ballard Beach. Um, currently, there is no street lighting plan that needs to be one developed. Um, so phase one, just some, some overview numbers. You got 25 total poles. You have 20 of those have lights on them. So each one left in the south part of the city. Um, phase two, 
kind of the same thing, 57 poles total, uh, 47 have street lights on them. Uh, as far as some numbers, uh, is replacing the wood poles, the concrete pole estimated at about $3,000 per pole. At 67 poles, you're looking at about 200K. Um, that would be installed, but you'd still have a lease on those poles. Um, another option would be solar. Solar is going to be more expensive. Again, this is something we need to look at down the road for the street lighting plan. Contingency estimates, uh, Duke Energy, they cover everything as far as putting the earth back. It does not take into account um, fixing landscaping, irrigation of that sort. Um, just something to think about, not, not, nothing major. Um, there's a 200K surplus after, if we did phase one, we get in budget year 2023, um, that could be used for other, other things. That, uh, Possibly switching on some concrete poles, possibly test bed uh, for solar lighting. And then again, if consolidating um, to look at the hurricane disaster reserve level and uh, reprogramming uh, American rescue funds. Ongoing, we want to. Validating against uh, fiscal years 2024 and 25, track our, our capital spending, um, calculate our burn rate. This is an ongoing process. Make sure that we're we're uh, seeing the same numbers that we, we previously calculated. Make sure we're on track. Um, based on this, we may want to look into accelerating under capital projects. The uh, one thing to consider, and I know we've talked about it in previous meetings, is we may be moving down the road with some of our stormwater products and not uh, reducing the scope of those projects, maybe not going the full uh, BMP that the engineer originally designed. So there could be some savings there. Um, again, have, have this reviewed by the prospective city manager and I'll take it to the citizens advisory committee for, for a sanity check and uh, possible ideas on the uh, line of credit. Uh, weighted factors for council to, to consider is the uh, strategic priorities um, with this project. The, uh, the cost, if it's, uh, if it's a reasonable cost, uh, if we're getting the best value for, for our money. Uh, funding, again, where we're we going to get the additional funding needed for this project. The uh, duration. How this project will impact things such as the traffic, how long it will last. Luckily in Bellar Beach, we have a oh, sorry. we have a very large right away compared to some of the other cities along Gulf Boulevard that have a lot of commercial property but not much space. So we are fortunate where what we did our previous underground on the west side of Gulf Boulevard there really wasn't a major impact of traffic along Gulf Boulevard. So that is a positive for us. Um, and then the uh, return on investment is always important. Conclusion, uh, key factors that binding cost estimate for both phase one, phase two for Duke is uh, expires on December 8th. So that is the, that's kind of our decision uh, date that we need to plan for. Um, it, the costs uh, at this point are foreseen to escalate and don't seem like they're going to be coming down. If anything, they're going to go up slightly or, or more depending on the situation in the future. Um, penny for pronounced money, the penny for money is already programmed for and locked in. The money will become available in the next three years. Um, we'll, one major thing to consider is that either if we do phase one now and do phase two later, it, it's still going to require supplemental funding. So regardless of the way or not, we're still going to need to fill that, that $1.2 million deficit that we have. Um, but we still have that 25k if we decide to do one and two at the same time. That's the savings. Still have that savings, yes. Um, cable company is not very dependable, as we've seen on uh, south of Gulf Boulevard on the east side, which they've already done, so almost down to 12th Street. They uh, they took a lot longer than I thought they were going. 
want to. So one one thing to know is that uh, you need to plan for a little bit more time, and, and then, you know, depending on how if we move forward with phase one and go into phase two, if there is time, um, where where you need to fit the capability in so that they get their stuff. Uh, we're in direct competition with the other cities, so if we don't get in line now, we might be like further back in the line, something that we need to consider. Um, get bids as large. The funds sitting in reserves, they're, they've been sitting there for, for some time now, and as we've seen with the cost of everything going up, they're depreciating as they sit there. They're not being invested. And it's just all along, we have infrastructure that isn't being repaired or improved. Um, consolidating both phase one and phase two, it, it sets a priority for the entire project moving forward with something that we plan on completing either way. The, uh, it aligns with the strategic plan, and it aligns with the safety for the residents, the best value for investment, and the aesthetics of the community. So the recommendation is to consolidate phase one and phase two, um, approving phase one on the September, in the September meeting, and then at the very latest approving phase two in November. I've, uh, it's not something we need to rush out, we still have time for phase two, but I've confirmed with the utility consultants that they will have no problem if we start them in September, October time period, doing an addendum to the agreement adding to the PO and then keep them moving forward. Um, we need to revise the hurricane fund um, and, and seek a supplemental line of credit. Uh, there's there's a lot of a lot of money that just sits there in the hurricane fund um, where we could accomplish the very same thing with a line of credit and keeping four hundred thousand dollars cash on hand. Um, the uh, American Rescue Funds we we can Utilize that, that's $802,000 that uh, again is, is a gift from the federal government and uh, this is a project that is, is a good investment for, for our community. It's something that we've already committed ourselves to, so it's a good use of funds for the American Rescue Money. The uh, streetlight master plan needs to be done, um, and so there needs to be more planning in that process of. of uh, Finding out what we want, um, what our options, what our end goal is for the street lighting plan, um, and then, as always, and, and I think we got a great start here with the uh, capital projects and, and calculating kind of what our reserves are going to do in the next three years. We need to, to continue to to look at our numbers, look at our capital projects, our spending, and, and, and track what our reserves are doing so they can make decisions based on those numbers. Then I'm going to take you to the other document here. Okay, and what this shows is our stormwater projects in the years that they're funded, and then some projections of. The, uh, the streets that coincide and how they're funded in the current year, um, giving us total numbers over here on uh, the left, the bottom left. Um, so that, that takes into account um, kind of a big picture of, of capital spending. Now you're still going to projects in your big chunk and then followed up by streets, which hit on a given year that you're moving the stormwater projects throughout the city. Um, those numbers are brought down here uh, to show major capital spending for those years. Anyone have any questions? Council. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start with it and uh, we'll, we'll go around. Uh, obviously, uh, we're on a deadline to approve this project. Otherwise, it would be requoted and most likely it will be higher. Um, did 
I hear you right that on the, ne the next council meeting you're going to ask for us to approve at least phase one. Yes. Okay. And I didn't quite understand what you were saying about the, the poles. You were going to cut the tops off and leave the lights on. So the idea is to, to, to think about what's going to make the biggest difference. Um, so I was showing that when the two energy comes through and the underground, all their wires, they're going to top those poles and they're going to cap them. And uh, kind of giving it a, a, a visual image of what you're going to be left with. Um, just moving forward on, uh, you know, we're, we're building resiliency by underground the wires and then uh, we're, we're improving the, the aesthetics of the community. Um, and we're, we're, we're accomplishing a lot. I guess the overall picture is that those cross wires that we already took care of were the worst part. The next worst part is going to be those, those high tension wires and removing those. And then where do we stand from there? So, yes, that's what I was And whenever you uh, speak of alternate funding, borrowing money, a lot of credit, what, what, what would be your source? Bank? Bank, yes. Yeah, I already have that they're looking into requirements. Okay. Jody Shirley? Um, just trying to get my head around everything right now because you threw the future of stormwater projects in here. And if I'm looking at this right, we still have after this year 3.5 million. It seems like that number, that number never goes down. <laughs> it just keeps getting bigger. It's that smaller, and we keep working away at that. I mean, I'm just doing some round numbers in my head, but it looks like after a fiscal year, 21, 22, we've got about remaining three and a half million, correct? So you're going to say in the, start, the total of the stormwater projects on this sheet? Yeah, because we don't have a total on that. So I'm just trying to get my hands around everything. But we do have... There is going to be a point um, with the, the progression of the stormwater projects where we may get to some of them that were recommendations of the, the master plan and, and, and think, this isn't something we need to do right now. You know, how much of a benefit are we going to get from doing this project? Well, that's what we talked about earlier, you know, some of the engineering reviews, you know, further in advance, so what those prior to committing. Right. It just seems like when we started this, yeah. however many years ago, it was four and a half. Um, we're like down to three and a half. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. we're having a real struggle. A lot of these, uh, <laughs> these budgets got multiplied by 1.3. Um, oh, saw okay. The last I got you. One. You got some. Okay. Um, yeah, I was looking through this. Um, first of all, you need to approach it through economies of scale. That twenty-five thousand dollars for consolidation is critical. I would, and I'm looking at this financially. I'm looking at yeah, doing both phases at once. Um, reason one: twenty-five k for consolidation. Number two: the reserves. We're way over our minimum reserves that we're required to have. You know, I do agree that we can remove some of that. Why? You addressed it succinctly. You said safety. If you look at it like a body, that's a thermal water. That is our main source of power for the entire city. If it's cut there or there, you've lost everything. You know, regardless of what other streets have done for undergrounding, those are the feeders. And by taking those underground, we've removed any potential costs that may be incurred due to a hurricane, number one, costs. Number two, down power lines. We had one down on our street and it was an extreme fire hazard because it's bouncing around. So the safety of the people by taking away the high voltage or the high tension lines, safety obviously in ensuring the city has um, a good contiguous power supply. So I like what you've done there. I agree with lowering the expenditure and using some of that excess money. Like I said, we're at least a million over in areas as well as using uh, now the, the stormwater. I defer to Councilman Shirley. You know the stormwater program as far as any potential savings that may be gleaned from there. So I I can't touch that analytically wise. I don't know what I'm talking about. The rest of it I agree with. Yeah, no, I'm in huge support of this. I can't to touch on this, but, um, um, but, you know, this, I was on the advisory committee when this was posed to us, and my, these are exact, exactly what my analysis was, was let's try to 
move some of this along, take some of those reserved funds, use them to move forward with these capital improvement projects that we just keep um, talking about and not getting done. The other thing, just as a side note, is that um, Patty forwarded us some information from Ford and Ellis, their last meeting. They have a billion dollars annually over the next five years in grant money to give to people for to the municipalities for safety improvements. So that might be a source for street lighting too. So just kind of thinking down the road, you know, I don't know if we have anyone that participates in the Ford and Ellis meetings, but we maybe should get someone on that. I think also uh, there, there's going to be a, a, a slew of grants that are released from the federal government very soon. Um, I think it's, it's part of it. And a huge bill that was just signed. Um, so whether we agree with it or not, we should grab whatever we can. All right, Sam. What's that? Can we get sand out of that? Yeah. Right? You have anything? I, I, Five million dollars in various lines is an awful lot of money, and safety works both ways. Line in sight is one thing, when you bury something, it's another. Um, how many jump, do you know how many junction boxes will be on Allen Golf Boulevard? Because you can only run the line so far, then you have to have another junction box. And I'll tell you one thing I've never seen a car hit a high power line up the top, but they do hit junction boxes, and they can be awful dangerous when they do. Um, but I think this money, where we live, would have been better served than putting in storm waters. Uh, I think we're too far along now to look back off on this, but I know going down Goth Boulevard, I, I, I see everybody with their head up like this looking at the lines. I Hopefully they're looking this way at the traffic. Uh, I just think this is useless money. This, this project would not have been possible had it been for me. Yeah, Penford Pinellas has factors in it, and capital improvements is one of the factors. And we could have used that capital improvements for a storm. I don't think so. I, 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 I think you kind of think you could have. I can I, provide a copy of the contract. It's currently for Gulf of our communication. So, um, and specifically underground, the city can't use their money for anything besides underground. It's really completely underground. But there's, there's, I believe there's a number of factors with that pennies and canals. I mean, I know we're getting it for beautification purposes, but if we would have looked at it for other avenues, I think we could have used it for storm water. With the same amount. It's got, I mean, it's got to be county use. That be used on the county roadway. So that's the, it's the county. And the county argument is. would have been the county has to come and pump all these sewers out all the time they're over flooding. Leslie? Um, I'm in favor of using some of the reserve money to fund some of these projects, and if there's grant money out there, that's that's great. I say we go ahead. Glenn, I think the best opportunity we have for grant money is for hardening utilities. Penny's money. From my understanding, definitely supports both of our unification. You know, we say unification, we're kind of, we're kind of, mis it's a misnomer because we're undergrounding and it's helping us hold the utilities. Aesthetically, if you top the poles, it's going to look pretty nice because when you top the poles and get rid of the upper high tension lines, what you're left with is High poles that pretty much blends in with the mature vegetation along the park. So you're not really going to see them. And if <clears throat> you keep those poles to the uh, east side of the sidewalks, you don't really see it. It keeps the boulevard pretty wide. If you go to solar lighting or something else where you have to move lights to the curbside, then you create a, a safety hazard for accidents. And also, it's going to kind of aesthetically and visually narrow the boulevard. I think the, uh, the strength of uh, Kyle's work with this was for the first time, council was getting a, a pretty good peep behind the budget curtain for reserves and uh, 
what the projected spend is for the capital projects in the ne at least the next couple of years. And uh, you've got a lot of money sitting on the sidelines that's not working for us right now. And, uh, I think Kyle's giving us a good alternatives for maybe tapping into that money and if you decide to pay yourself back uh, expeditiously or whatever. It's up to the council to kind of decide what's the sleep factor. If we use some of that hurricane money and we want to make some of it restricted funding, well, what's that level? What's going to allow us to sleep at night? 300, 400,000, 500,000, 500,000. That needs to be kind of like the uh, consensus of this body to do it. But I think the fact that he's looked ahead and forecast his projects and he's made some assumptions and stuff to kind of uh, give us some conservative numbers here. It gives us an opportunity to look down the road and see if we do want to accelerate some of the stormwater projects or street lighting or whatever. It's the first time that I think uh, Kyle and his staff have ever looked that far ahead. I think he's done some great work here. Definitely. Okay, so I, I think the, uh, the question is, is do we want to see phase one only or phase one and phase two on the uh, for both at our next council meeting. Uh, that's the, uh, that's, that's where I believe we're going. Um, so, phase one only, phase one and two. Okay. Um, as far as uh, the borrow side of things goes, that's something we'll have to vote for later, correct? That's correct. Okay. And uh, I'd like to take it to the Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, just get some input from them. Please do. Uh, so Kyle, I think you did an excellent job. My arguments wasn't against you, it's just the project. I think what you, what you presented was great. Okay. We've got Ron in the audience. Maybe you could just give us a quick overview of the line of credit and how it worked. He had suggested that at one time. This is actually a good suggestion. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Councilmember Brown, um, Kyle, kind of great job. And we had this conversation, as Joey mentioned, um, eight months ago that this project was here. This was going to be what it would take. And uh, you know, we looked at it and we thought that it was the right thing to do. Plenty of reserves is one thing we don't see much uh, in your balance sheet. And so you know, how much cash is really sitting in the bank account. So everyone should sleep well. That there's plenty of uh, short term cash, but it would be an easy uh, uh, line of credit. The, the leverage that this the city has is nominal relative to its revenue, so any lender that is uh, schooled in municipal lending would easily provide that. Uh, there will be probably some caveat that would need to move some deposits to that lender um, as a result. Uh, but as long as you don't borrow money, it doesn't cost you anything. And the way that Reserve works is historically, is, you know, there's a lot of expenses when a hurricane comes, and then we get reimbursed from FEMA afterwards. So we'll spend the money, and then we'll get it back uh, at the end of the day. So I think uh, I, I uh, support what you guys are doing, moving this to the agenda sooner versus later. Uh, we'll take a deeper dive with Kyle uh, on the, in, in the system of the council as well. Thank you very much. Um, well, since we've had one citizen speak to me and one old slide too on this topic. No? All right. Uh, Kyle, it sounds like you got your marching orders and uh, we look forward to seeing this come up in the next meeting. And a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Council. All right. Next up, uh, discussion of smoking on the beach. I bring this up because it seems to be a trend that's beginning to happen on many of the beaches uh, here in Florida. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that um, CSHB 105 became law. And uh, City Attorney Arm, would you like to uh, explain exactly what this law does uh, for us? Happily, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the, the Mayor's correct in stating it wasn't too long ago that this became law. We're talking about is a change in the legislation um, that took effect July 1st. Up until July 1st of this year, individual municipalities did not have the ability 
to prevent smoking in public parks and beaches. You may have seen signs in places or gone to beaches where they said that they did, but they couldn't really enforce it. Um, what you saw in a lot of communities were thank you for not smoking signs. Uh, more of an approach of, as a courtesy, please buy. But nobody was getting issued a citation or anything of the sort. Um, if they were, they were often challenged and then those ordinances were invalid. So what the law did is it changed what historically in Florida was known as the Clean Indoor Air Act to just the Clean Air Act. And I'll, I'll read the language as it stands now. What it, say, what it states is, counties and municipalities may further restrict smoking within the boundaries of any public beaches and public parks that they own, except that they may not further restrict the smoking of unfiltered cigars. A municipality may further restrict restrict smoking within the boundaries of public beaches and public parks that are within its jurisdiction but are owned by the county unless such restriction conflicts with the county ordinance, except that they may not further restrict the smoking of unfiltered cigars. Yes, that is how it reads. Yes, there is a particular carve-out. Um, the idea being, from a, from a home rule standpoint, this is a bit of a win in that we got back, or understanding that we have a universe of powers that are taken away from, we got back a substantial amount of power, but yes, if you were just trying to say full stop, no form of smoking, you can't do that. Unfiltered cigars are accepted. Uh, what I think the, the mayor is touching on is more recently there's been a discourse within the Big C and other beach communities on now that we are allowed to talk about doing this, what do we as an individual community here or elsewhere wish to do? And that's what this workshop is. is do you wish to see an ordinance regulating this activity or not? Um, and that's you know a discussion for you folks to have. It's not something that and, you know, again, this being a work session, we're not going to come out of here and suddenly it's prohibited. Any ordinance would go on first and second reading with all appropriate public input. Uh, but before any work is expended, one of the things we talked about in my interviewing process was I worked for the body, the collective. And uh, this is truly a legislative matter. You have, there's no, there's no competent substantial evidence standard or anything. You have the ability to make this policy if you so desire. And you can make a policy that's less than that. You can say, we're okay with... We know we can't touch unfiltered cigars, we know and while we're at it, we don't care about pipes either. You have the ability to define your universe if you so desire. And again, I'm just telling you what your abilities are. I'm not lobbying for any one result. I don't try to persuade, I advise. Right, and, uh, and, and my purpose for bringing this up is because it does keep coming up in the big C meetings. And also, I think just about everyone here has participated in beach cleanups. Um, I would say the number one item that I pick up are cigarette butts, the plastic caps, whatever it is, they don't go away ever. Um, that and bottle caps. If I have my way, bottle caps will remain permanently attached somehow to the bottle rather than mm -hmm. taking them off. But uh, anyway, uh, I just wanted to throw this out to the council and see what the uh, consensus was what the general direction was, and how you felt about it. I, I can tell you from this, the discourse on this in, in at least one other community, uh, PCSO, to the extent they enforce your code, said they will enforce what you, whatever you put on the books. That has generally been the sheriff's um, stance on this. I'm not aware of the county taking any kind of incongruent action with your ability to, uh, at least at this point, to, to regulate. I would advise from a practical standpoint um, especially in a community where you have so many condominiums with people overlooking the beach. From a practical standpoint, you're not likely to see people getting citations by the dozen on this issue. Um, you know, the time it takes to get to somebody once you've learned and then we get there and find out, oh, that's an unfiltered cigar, we can't. Um, more likely than not, this will be a, you can't do that here, put it out. Or, you know, the person responds before they're, you know, encountered or something of the sort. Again, I'm telling you, PCSO will enforce. But from a practical standpoint, resource allocation, the simple fact that you see somebody smoking doesn't necessarily mean that that person's going to have a court date um, immediately. Um, and, and that'll ultimately be an administrative decision for you folks as to what resource do we want to allocate to this and uh, you know, what, what, do, what education period do we want to do or before we start citing people, we want people to get to know what our rules are if we change. Yeah, it's practically unenforceable. I mean, you look at this, everybody thinks of cigars as giant stogie, but and when you get down to it, now you're looking in about 10 foot down the beach at somebody. And the big difference is what you're seeing on the beach is the filter, not the cigarette, but just the filter. 
And that's why we talk about the no filter. I mean, you can see a cigar or a cigarette, especially if they're covering that filter up with their hand, which most people do. Now, if you, know, if you want that cop to kind of go in and enforce it, then the guy opens up his hand and says, that's an unfilter. You know, this whole thing disappears when I finish, nothing's left. So, me, I'm kind of a wait and see what the other cities do, because really, this is almost 100% unenforceable. Very difficult to write. Lloyd? Yeah, I, I think the good news is, just generally, less people are, are smoking these days. Um, that's good. I think we would be, I think it might work better if we sometime, somehow put some signage out there where we are asking people on the beach to please, whatever verbiage we could come up with, the, the message would be, hey, don't, don't leave your cigarette butts on the beach. If, if you could help us out by doing that. I think that may be effective. I know in the evenings when I'm walking the beach, there are oftentimes things being smoked that don't fit into any of the categories we, we've referenced. So, uh, you know, it's going to happen. But, but I think if somehow we can get people to not leave the remnants of whatever they're smoking on the beach, on the sand. And I know we've kind of broached the, the topic a bit comically, but I, I do think it warrants noting, um, just because paradigms have shifted on the issue, um, in this discourse, uh, sometimes it does come up about marijuana smoke and marijuana um, presence, and because of the medical marijuana laws in the state, people have a legal ability with the car to, to smoke that product, and whereas in an old paradigm, the simple presence of the smoke is evidence of something we need to enforce against, from a law enforcement standpoint, that's not always the case. And so that also has changed where people, you know, you, you may get community feedback saying, I'm not so concerned with these cigarettes, but what are you guys going to do about the weed on the beach? Um, you know, again, that paradigm has shifted as well from a regulatory standpoint. And there's, uh, I thought that laws were in place that prevented people from smoking marijuana in the I'm not going to opine specifically on how that functions and where you know public may be, and especially as we start talking about beaches where it's, I'm at the edge of my buddy's backyard, I'm not quite on the beach. Um, but suffice to say, there are places where you can, in the simple presence of that smoke, you know, whether it be from your car in a public location or otherwise, is not necessarily evidence of crime. Frank? I don't know why I have this satire thing in my head with this big fat bureaucrat puffing on a cigar, making walls, state, um, saying you can't do this, but I can do this. I don't know how some of this stuff that's this, some of this crap that's passed through the house and then the governor signs off on it. I just had, I know, uh, what was it, 100, 115 walls got renewed, I think, in July, maybe Mr. Morgan, or uh, 15 new walls came out. One of them was two residents are grabbing within the last month about the 25 foot sound coming out of a car or a vehicle. They're saying if the radio, if I can hear a radio 25 <coughs> feet from the vehicle, it's against the wall now. That's another wall that just came out in July, uh, and they're, they're complaining about these motorcycles going up and down Boulevard, Boulevard, and we can hear it from the causeway to Harris. Uh, hey. I clean the beach. I think I've missed one beach cleanup since I've been here. Um, and I agree with you. Cigarette butts, cigarette butts, cigarette butts are all over the place. If we can kill them, let's do it. Um, let's get the bottle caps next because they get into the fish. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily believe this has anything to do with clean air, but I do think <laughs> that it probably is a, a good way to, uh, to at least curb some of the, uh, um, some of the littering. I think an ordinance prohibiting smoking on the beach is more trouble than it's worth. A sign that says, clean up your stuff when you get off the beach. You know, <laughs> put, maybe put more garbage cans at the beach accesses. Yeah, I think, I think the goal is more, uh, instead of enforcement, it's probably more just uh, awareness. Yeah. awareness. Awareness. Yeah, I'm. I'm just not in favor of, of uh, passing any, any, anything in relation to this. I agree. I 
I'd go out and clean up the beach. The only thing I pick up are cigarette butts, typically. Maybe a Coke bottle here or there or something, but, um, and, it's, and it's disgusting. I don't know smokers where they think these cigarette butts are going, but the flip side is we started with no smoking indoors. So now we're saying no smoking outdoors. I just, I have a real problem with I don't think there should be a seat seatbelt law. I just don't want anyone telling me what I can and can't do. It's a personal preference. And I don't smoke. No one in my family smokes. It doesn't affect me either way. But there are people that will affect, and I just don't think it's right. Thank you. Blair. I'm in concurrence with everybody. I, I think we have better needs to address rather than writing ordinances that are enforcement. That's fine. So uh, the purpose of this discussion was for me to take our answers back to the big C. And because I, I think as uh, all of um, San Keith, uh, we're, we're trying to sort of line up our policies. And uh, I've already had one mayor say, eh, I don't think so. Um, I would love to see the cigarette butts going away, and I like the idea of possibly, uh, what, well, there's a couple of things. Number one, we don't actually provide any place to put the cigarette butts, so where else are they going to put them? Um, don't want them in the trash, because it's going to cause a fire. Um, but do, do we have any of those? Do, do we? we have some. There was some some mud deep bugs with the uh, beach accesses in at Morgan Park. All of them? Yes. Okay. It's five total. Maybe I just steer. Oh, you know what? You're right. Okay, so they're just not using them. Yeah, a lot of times they'll stick them in the trash can and they'll melt the side of the trash can. Gotcha. It's a small fire. Well, it's something to look into. Uh, I will take this back. Uh, I I could go either way on this one. Are you getting it? You said just one mayor's fault you so far. A bunch of mayors said. Yeah, well, uh, I read in the paper today that uh, St. Pete Beach is seriously considering it, but they're not ready to move on it just yet. So this is this is a, the beginning of a conversation. Okay. Even though this seems like something uh, a, a very minor topic to be discussing, uh, I would consider this at least something positive in the right the right direction of the whole world. They, the state actually allowing us to do something and not controlling us. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to jump on it, but hey, it's a start. I mean, somebody's actually listening, uh, giving us the opportunity to regulate ourselves. Any other conversation about that? Ready to move on? All right. Uh, next is uh, discuss rules of unlicensed handyman handyman and do-it-yourselfers. I put this one on also uh, because of numerous complaints about uh, code enforcement and um, just the way things are being handled. I think many people don't realize that, that they can't hire a handyman to paint their house. I didn't know that. Did, it, did anyone know that? That you can't just hire an unlicensed person to paint your house. I couldn't hire you to paint my house. Nope. You mean the outside what? versus the inside? Any, any paint. Any paint. I was not aware of that. How about if I do it for free? But <laughs> is there a licensed painting? <laughs> yeah. This guy's painting my house. I don't know how it's going. <laughs> Donations. So. <laughs> the reason why I bring this up is because I think that maybe we should. We should provide some something, uh, a small, maybe a three-page folder or something that uh, we can distribute to the residents that say, here's some do's and don'ts, because there's been quite a few people that are in trouble, they've had stop work, um, notices, uh, all sorts of things going on where they're hiring a handyman, or they got a buddy, or their next door neighbor's helping them, they're getting shut down, and uh, maybe maybe it's just an educational issue more than just hiding. Especially if they're doing the work and they're not taping up all their windows and hiding out inside. You know, those are the ones that I would worry about. But 
Mr. Mr. Mayor, you're making some good points that I'm not clear on because if I'm helping my neighbor out in the sprinkler system or something like that or a uh, fence, um, is that out of bounds what you're saying? Or well, this I'm, thing, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Yeah, I'm okay. not trying to put you on the spot. Just you, know, you brought it up. I just want to. Well, there's just certain there's certain items that uh, require permitting. You have to own the project yourself, and even then, so it may require a permit, where it's not requiring a license. Right. And, and you may be question. able to. You can. One of the one of the nuances here is you may be able to do that, but you have to have a permit to do it. Um, you know, I, I at one point in my home, for example, in a former home of mine, we wanted to put up two walls, and I called a, a contractor and said, "Hey, what's it cost to put up two walls?" And he quoted me a number. I said, okay, well, just so you know, I'm a city attorney for a living, so we're going to need to do this on the up and up. Are there any permits or anything else? Like, oh, well, if you're going to go that route, it's going to be a whole other thing. <laughs> no, I've heard that. Um, you know, and then, the price, and then I did get a, a properly licensed contractor, and the price tripled, and then they had to hardwire electrics because the city reviewed it and said, you know, the building code says this. And so I understand why people, you know, on occasion will not do that. But what I would say to you, to you folks, too, if you do want to, to look into educational materials, this is a high priority, or has been over the past few years for PCSO. They may already have materials um, crib, that, that we can crib from and use, and just say, hey, here's already the PCSO flyer on this. Um, because, I mean, they, when I say it's been a priority for them to the point that they've set up sting houses, hey, we've got a vacant property um, for, you know, and, and just solicit, hey, we're looking for somebody to come do the roof, and everybody who shows up who's an unlicensed contractor saying, I'll do your roof for, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, and you know, I, because yeah. it is a criminal violation, and they do pursue that. That's really the bigger permitted stage. I mean, for a lot of frankly, you know, well, first of all, one of the largest corporations in the world is Home Depot and Lowe's, and they're based on the predicate of do it yourself. I do myself. I'm allowed to do it myself. I can redo my house if I want. All I got to do is, if it falls under the permit. I'm allowed to pull that permit. As, a, as the Florida homeowner, and it's my primary residence, I'm good. Right. If you can buy the windows permit. and swap them out and never have somebody look at it. But I can have it permitted. I can pull the permit. I can have whoever work for me. So long as that work passes the inspector. Right. So you're absolutely good with doing it. I can hire you tomorrow. If I pull the permit, you do the work, and it passes inspection. But I'd have to be licensed. I would not necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. And, and I think that's that, where it's really. Well, and I, I think that this, in, this discussion is generally informative on. Yeah. It seems like there's a lot of nuance and misunderstanding, potentially. Um, and so there may be value in getting resources on what is the. Yeah. And I can't get into the, you know, the point being discussed. No, I, it's just, you know, I've had neighbors come up like, can't get the electricity, and they've got a bad breaker, yeah, and they they're 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 everything. I pulled breakers out and replaced breakers and I've done wiring. Yeah, yeah we've done wiring. Right. Right. We right. complete the fence. Right. Right. Network right. systems. Right. I'm always getting called. Never, never charged a dime. We did take the nation. Yeah. I take, yeah, <laughs> one piece of vice mayor gun. After the last code review, Laura put out that pamphlet on the changes and stuff. And it goes right to the heart of the code enforcement thing we were talking about before because uh, public awareness is a big part of this thing. And we had talked in a previous work session about putting out a reminder of codes and stuff like this. And this would be the perfect addendum, like, oh, by the way, while we're on the subject, you know, there are some issues and concerns about this. And again, public awareness and education might be the perfect. Um, I do know that uh, roofing and plumbing oh. and electrical, I don't even think you're allowed to do it on your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are. I think if I'm the homeowner or man with a permit. Uh, some things are permitted. <laughs> Unless you're changing the whole structure. If I'm changing a load, if I'm, I mean, if I'm going to load a panel, the panel's going to be I'm going to take the whole panel out. That's perfect. Panel and I have to yeah. do it. If I'm wearing an outlet, we need clarification. Yeah. I'm good to go on that one. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> how much work do you do at your house here, dude? Well, that's, <laughs> the whole point is, is because yeah. uh, I don't want to see everybody getting in trouble all the time for all this work. And it's it's really a bad problem uh, anyway because, first off, nobody wants to do a little job. Nobody. So then you hire a handyman to do a little job, and 
you pay them what it's really worth, or you go through the proper process, and it does cost three or four times because no one wants to do a little job. And if you do find somebody to do the work, you might as well wait six months before they can get to you. I, I want to, I'd like to put an awning out yeah. back and forget it. No, no one will even talk to me about it. But it's a I'm, small job. But if I may, all my problems has always been with licensed insured contractors. When we redid our house, we had to take that guy to court because they were basically claiming work progress that they never did because we were up in Maryland. We finally came down here and found out they were doing nothing. So we had to hire another contractor, obviously, we watch also licensed, but just because they're licensed and insured doesn't mean they're reputable. And that's always been a problem in Florida. Yeah. Just getting that person that's not only licensed and insured, but actually does the work. And they come out and do the work. Yeah, and on time, <laughs> on but you know, you know, the whole uh, Amen. Yeah, check the courthouses. <laughs> and then uh, I know that Mike Kelly, uh, he is working with the county to to uh, basically up the uh, uh, the fines and watching people more closely. And uh, maybe he has some insight on this also. I'll reach out to him. And uh, see if maybe he'd like to come speak to us for a few minutes just so that it puts us in the right direction. I just feel like we're, we need to, to help our community because there's just so much going on right now. And uh, I don't, you see it, you know what's going on. There's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, what, what's the volume of the projects where you're seeing illegal activity and and uh, Clapp is having to step in and shut people down and things like that. It's happening almost every day. And, and how, much, how much would you say of it is ignorance versus just trying to get away with something? I, I, I question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because they claim ignorance. Yeah. They are not. <laughs> they yeah, they're very adamant that they don't need what they Randy, you said you've got that the the sheriff's office has something. I'm saying they may. I don't. I don't know. But given oh. what a priority it is, I imagine yeah. that they have if you can, some kind of educational material that may save like that. our administrative resources. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to reach out to their their council. Okay. So uh, someone mentioned stealing information from another agency. Um, that's just called legal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's an approved source. Right. So, so um, I'm sure almost, I mean, if you went to the city of Largo, they probably have some handouts that they give you the permitting office. I'll call them and see if they have something, if I can get my hands on it. Yeah, just anything we can yeah. get our hands on to take a look at for examples, and uh, I don't think there's a yeah, problem. Yeah, but y'all are done being us licensed contractors. Thank you very no, much. No, 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 I'm not saying you. I'm seeing some other guys. I'll give you the names if you want. Hey, it took me forever well, to I get a fence. I need a huge support of enforcing license. I don't know. I have no problem with that at all. My point yeah, is, is sure that it's, it's, it's a struggle between because it, it is hard to get the small jobs done. It, it is tough. And if, you know, but the flip side is, do you want someone on a 35 foot ladder that doesn't have insurance on the property? I mean, you're kind of protecting the homeowners. Too. Right. So there's some some pros and cons to it. It's tough both sides. I get it. Yep. But you know, and that is the disadvantage to not living in the area for a long time. You know, like if I need something done, I get a licensed person like that. I don't, you know, have to worry that I can get something done. But you know, it doesn't. You have to be in the business. So we're all going she knows to be the licensed contractors, so we'll get things done. But I mean, they came to my house. There, I was painting the outside of my house. Well, my mayor resigned and said, we need to see places. You know, of course, it's on the side of his truck. We didn't bother. They wanted to see the hard license. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll uh, revisit this a little bit later. Uh, now we're on the general business. Uh, a couple of things came in. The first one was this uh, library uh, letter. We 
anyone see this? Is it distributed anywhere else? No. So, um, I'll just read it. Uh, Dear Mayor Gaddis, Nellis Public Library Cooperative Incorporated is made up of 14 member libraries geographically located throughout Nellis County. Collectively, they provide access to over 2 million items, including books, DVDs, music, ebooks, audiobooks, and a wide array of online resources. In addition to materials for recreational and educational use, our libraries provide a variety of programs for adults, teens, and children. Together, our member libraries enrich the quality of life for all our users. In accordance with the interlocal agreement, I am providing you with notification of the per capita amount required for your participation as a member of the cooperative. Each of your members has submitted audit, uh, audited reports documenting the cost of running their local library. Based on these reports, we calculated the cost at $35.79 per capita. Your membership fee for fiscal year 23, should you wish to join the cooperative, is based on your population multiplied by the per capita cost. Miller Beach, population 1632, times $35.79 is $58,409.28. Now, haven't we been participating, but it's, we said yes. only a few per capita? Reimburse no. people that requested the card. Uh, that sounds like you're paying if you do that. Yeah, everybody everybody's covered if you do that. You join, like, you join the job, you're covered. Then everybody gets their card. So reimbursing yeah. is much less. Why would they even... Well, I wanted to bring it up because <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, uh, I know that we do this every year, but I don't recall it being presented this way. No, they want to charge the city so that all of our citizens may use. No, we'll never or, use. Well, right. right. So That's what we do it. is those that wish to use it, we reimburse. And it's a much lower number. They get to pay 50 bucks for a library card, and we give them their 50 bucks back. Yeah. We make sure that they're yeah. continuing that service. Just pay no, I mean, if they're not changing it, you have to join as the city. And I don't know what. Are we certain what they're telling us there? Are they telling us that we have to join as a city and they're no longer offering it? Your membership fee, should you wish to join the cooperative? Are we part of the cooperative? Not currently, no. So we're just they have we're just pay. members. We're not part of the cooperative because we we're, we're individual members. The way I believe. Yeah. Anybody yeah. in that county? Would, would you pursue this, please, and find out what they're talking about? You have a copy of this already. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, it seems like one other thing came in. Uh, maybe not.
business. I mean, this the attorney, just a quick question. Uh, this lower rate, what Mr. Trotter's doing, would that satisfy the requirements? But I just need the official. What requirements? I'm sorry, I'm not understanding the question. Uh, the requirements of the city council to have minutes or video available. I'm not familiar with the precise term. My understanding was the discussion was, was principally around the fiscal allocation, looking at the agreement now. And, and when, it, when Kyle says it's, it's illegal, I'm not pretending that this is an extensive thing. I received it last week and plan to prioritize it this week. Um, but the you're looking at the fee, Section 4, is that where you're No, at? I just did if what he's proposing to provide us. Um, our requirement as a city council, we don't need a edited video put out. There's no legal requirement that any public meeting, most public meetings, be recorded via audio or video for that matter. Communities do it for the reasons of one, it makes it easier to produce the minutes. Two, added transparency and engagement with the public. Um, and three, additional records to document the decision making process. Uh, but there's nothing under the Sunshine Law that requires ordinary meetings. There's some exceptions. But ordinary meetings being recorded via audio or video. Okay, that's what I want to know. So the editing is not a requirement. No, it, it may give you a better final product um, if that's something you're interested in, but it's not. There's no statutory requirement that any video produced by a municipality be edited to, you know, in Platform X or... It, it, frankly, it, frankly, it's like by editing, it implies that you're trying to hide something. And with today's technology, somebody said, well, meeting's too long. Well, they all have fast forward. I can take that thing and go right to the end if I want or do whatever I want at home. I, I would, I would, I would quibble with the, uh, with the characterization that editing implies destruction, but I understand that. And I don't mean that you're that conspiratorial notion in our, in our society generally. Um, when you say something's edited, that means you're hiding something. I, I get what you mean. Um, I think it's standard in audiovisual production that that's a term that just means we're eliminating the white noise and dead spaces and, and all that. Kyle, were we receiving a flat rate on, uh, prior to this? No, we were always getting that, that two hour uh, base rate with the uh, additional hours calculated after the one over two. And what was the additional hour rate? It was the same rate. It was the same. Can I, can I just clarify, he's going to be keeping an eye on the monitor to make sure if anyone's raising their hand. Yes. I think that's going to be about your greatest benefit is just having someone there who's Okay, so we're that. talking about hiring a part-time clerical worker. Why can't we have that part-time worker come in and head to the meetings? and do that for $20 an hour. It's definitely an option. Vice Mayor, yes. I was going to throw out uh, a suggestion about looking into an intern program. Uh, I, I'd actually looked at some stuff for the St. Pete Junior College and this right. internship program and all you got to do is go out and say, hey, I, I'm looking for some kid who's in, uh, you know, uh, information resources or audiovisual stuff and I need them for X number of hours a week and we typically compensate them a little bit obviously there's no benefits or anything like that but these guys are jumping for real world experience and hands on stuff and all it takes would be a letter to or a call to the St. Pete Junior College and say I like that idea. I need it. Yeah, I say for if you look right now Kyle is running the meeting. He's, he's yeah. running the, the, the video conference. Uh, he's gotten up three times, I think. What's the difference between now and our, our city council? Well, what we're happens is yeah. during a regular council yeah. session, people will want to speak. Yeah. Well, you, you've had that tonight. Um, I think, Kyle, you were saying that they don't speak to it. Yeah. Well, they, they don't do it on their own. Someone has to moderate it. So someone has to sit there and actually be ready to, to click. And Patty is busy with uh, minutes, and Kyle is in the city manager role. But as an intern, yes, SPC will definitely. Yeah. Dr. Crunch, I think, will be more than welcome to set something in. Yeah. Yes. Interns are great, but for a meeting, you need someone you know who's going to show up. And that's the problem you run into with interns. They don't always show up when they're supposed to. So I, I do feel like we have to have a paid, you know, it could a, be a paid, a paid position. Right? 
typically in Congress. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the point uh, Member Shirley is making is somebody who is in a contract with you has obligations to you right. and breaches and understanding. And, and that's, a pers that's a policy decision you folks will make, but I think that's the, the broader point. One of our people, one of our own people can say, okay, you know, we, we agree to over time for to cover the meeting. Well, a lot of times what happens is people come in and intern programs, and the people like them so much they turn around and hire them or offer them some sort of part time job. So, you know, it, it, it can be a self serving kind of thing, too. It allows us to look at people and say, hey, we really like you, and maybe you'd like a part time job with some kind of side. Yeah. Well, we put, our, our meetings generally run about three to four hours. Worst case scenario, around four hours these days. Yeah, not as bad as it used to be. It doubled that, yeah. Yeah. So, um, look at the, uh, the amount of money here. We're, we're, we're $525 for a three-hour meeting. That's a lot of money. Past, I understood it because it does take forever to edit. You have to take that raw video and you have to turn it into something that you can put back online. But what we want to give them is what they're seeing live. And I think that that's way simpler than $500 worth of it. Um, it's not an attorney. Jeez. Happy birthday. Glenn Gunn said you were looking live. <laughs> so uh, the direction, uh, what do we want to do? So Patty, what you put on our website currently, that's an audio version of our council meeting. That's what you you do that, right? Right. I take the audio, Kyle does something to it, and then I put it on the website. I don't know what Kyle does to it. <laughs> Convert it to a video, and then I upload it to YouTube, and I give it a link on the website. But it's an audio only. Right? It starts as an audio, and I make it a video by putting the city seal behind it. YouTube, you can only upload videos. Okay. Yeah, let me give you some back history. Um, Several years ago, we said we weren't doing enough. We wanted our residents to be able to see us out. And so, um, if it was audio only, we would not be doing any more than we've been doing for the past few years. Um, uh, whenever we have these small meetings, correct? That's what, that's what we've been doing is uploading audio. But these meetings with Zoom, because we're recording it, there's nothing to do. It's just a matter of uploading it after you can save it into the computer. Um, so, really, we just need somebody that can run to it. And compile and train them if they don't have yeah, it. It's not that hard. Really just not and, train. and I also yeah. wonder, is it possible that we already have staff that would be interested in making a little extra cash during our meetings? Could be possible. Because we do have a few people that do work. Victor has been with us for, as he says, over seven years and has done a wonderful job and I would be in favor of keeping him re-upping his contract. I don't have a problem with keeping him. I have a problem with, with his rate. Okay. It seems very pricey. And I'm aware of the feeling that, yeah, uh, we don't need this. Um, we just transfer over to somebody that works for us. I mean, the city manager does work for us. We got his direction. It's like, okay, the direction is provide somebody to do this, and we are willing to, you know, uh, provide financially for that volunteer that comes forward to do this. I thought about the area of insurance. They're covered. We know who they are. You monitor their work quality as well as we do, and we're saving. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it's about. Even at the 330 rate, it was at 165 an hour. Yeah, God forbid you run over. I don't want to truncate our the, the people's business by saying we really can't go much further because we're paying this person you know X amount every hour of we work. I bet if we offer Victor a contract two hours plus one hour, but it's a salary now type of position where. He has six hours, he has to stay six hours. He has two hours. Flat rate would be yeah, easier to swallow. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. I know he wants to, he wants to 
keep working with us, but um, th this is, if we have one of those bad meetings, um, it's is a very expensive bad meeting. <laughs> what, what's set aside in the budget for the is uh, I mean, we're paying similar right now. Situation, uh, subjective terms yeah. is what I would yeah. say. Where's the 
is it located on the property? Like, is it on the edge of the property, up the it's street? It's in the middle of the property where it could take a house out at 9th Street, two houses out on Bay, um, and then one on Main Street. I was thinking, like, if it's a property line and hang over someone's property, yeah. that's one thing, but you can yeah, there's other things. Frank, yeah. think about transmission power. We, we can't just jump on that either. That's I, worse. I know, but um, it, it, the resident was here to refresh everyone's memory. Uh, the last little storm we had blew a lot of things right through his uh, pool. I'm sure everybody remembers it. I do. Um, and he's, he's highly concerned, and he should be. I mean, uh, and there were three other neighbors were too. But There's I understand what you're saying, Mayor, about the legal part. I mean, right. Yeah, but if Mr. Moore could look into that, maybe. We could do something like that. I'm going to tell you that my inclination is likely that the answer will be if there are concerned neighbors, they may have private remedies, but that doesn't necessarily render them the local jurisdiction's yeah. responsibility or ability for that. The next door has the more, more power than the, than the city has, right? Potential. And, and then here's the other thing that maybe the neighbor the neighbors could get together and turn the tree. If no one's at the property and no one's maintaining it, that would be, if I was concerned about falling on my house, I would trim the tree. And can we do that? Deal with that? Can you? Probably not legally. But, you know, I would deal with the house. Council woman, I was thinking that route. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, but please. here's the difference. Like, I do it with trees. I've got one hanging over my office. Well, if it's building. hanging in your yard, you can trim it. But, but I'm talking about this one, it's tilting. Top it off. You just trim it down. Top it off. Because the neighbors approached this guy at all. Yes. And offered to take it down. Um, it, he's. I don't want. I don't want to give you thirty in information, but he, he wasn't very uh, amenable to the objection. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Gunn, you have. Uh, Is there any action coming out of this? Or can I bring up another topic? Go right ahead. Uh, you know, for the longest time, uh, parking lot issues. I, I just happened to be in a parking lot on 19th Street and was sitting there, and a couple cars came in without the Miller Beach to her. And it's one of those times like, man, I wish there was a sheriff deck. The mall sheriff deck was the whole day, and he sat there for a while. And then finally, he walked over and started citing cars and ended up on the beach looking for people, hey, you know, move the car. and then. Well, he's talking to somebody, they're, they're all lining up with their citations at hand to take up his valuable time. And my question is, is we've talked about towing services, and where has that gone? I mean, this predates the umbrella stuff. We, we thought of it as a possibility to subvert the people just coming in doing dump and runs and you know, whatever. And I'm sure there is not a Miller Beach resident who, if he walked through that parking lot and saw a car there without a sticker, wouldn't drop a dime on one of those people. And I'm just wondering, why have we pursued this? It's because it's we can't do it. We can't do it. We legally cannot do it. It's not our problem. And now on our lots, we can. Right? It's but, not our property to two from. But the, if you're talking about the accesses that are shared, the access. Access. Beller Shores, but considered part of our general shared community at large, and that's their property to regulate and enforce on. So you're correct that even in my brief tenure, we've had discussions, but our discussions are we are prepared to facilitate and enable if they move in that policy direction, but we can't unilaterally, um, as a commission, say we're going to hire a tow company and put up the proper signage and have them start to. So have you broached that with Beller Shore? Is it worth a letter from Beller Beach to Beller Shore saying, hey, or I could just pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, what do you think? What's your thoughts? Well, help facilitate it. My understanding is that this is part of a broader dialogue on what's happening in the accesses, and they are aware of that um, inclination. I know, um, I know I, in very broad terms, spoke with their city attorney to say, hey, is there any amenability to this? I know it was discussed at the meeting I was at, but that's part of a broader discussion of what's happening at, the at those accesses and how the two communities are going to find the gray area of the Venn diagram where they're both happy about a whole bunch of issues. Um, so understanding this issue, issue isn't happening in a vacuum, um, I, I don't know that we have an ability to meaningfully advance. 
advance it um, beyond what their policy priorities are at any given time. I, I can tell you that they don't have a problem with vehicles being towed, but it's never actually, I've been to several of their meetings and I've never actually seen them have a serious conversation about it. But there's nothing stopping me from bringing it up at one of their meetings. This Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, I'm coming up Golf Boulevard. I go in the 6th Street. There's a nice gentleman urinating all over the wall. Okay? And I'm going to go. And he looks at me. And it's 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. That's what happens in their backyards. Yeah. And, and they do have a legitimate complaint, okay, about some of the abuse. I mean, and, and then who, what, ha, ha, what comes 10 minutes later? A new to pick the guy up. So, and they, you know, I mentioned that on in one of the meetings that I attended, and I think there's been a lot of mention of it. I think it's maybe we make a phone call, but I think an official letter from the city saying we are willing to facilitate this if you'll give approval, so that they'll talk about it in their council meeting rather than it just being you know, okay, okay, I can talk. Uh, you know. Ask please put it on the yeah. I, I think the residents want that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, any other business right now? Yes, sir. Uh, I got two things. Um, I don't know if anyone saw this. We got a notification from the uh, Charles County Sheriff's like event coordinator uh, notifying us that on October 2nd, uh, Clearwater is doing a half marathon and it's going to close Gulf Boulevard north of Causeway from 7 7.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. Yeah. Complete? Mm -hmm. Complete, yeah. So, they usually do lane closure. Yeah, they usually yeah. do one. As yeah. I run that. Yeah. They okay. usually do lane closure. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Okay, because they told us closed. I don't think I've ever seen it completely shut down. Okay. And there's, there's always directing traffic. We've been doing it for years. Yeah. It's COVID okay. stuff. Yep. All right. And then the other thing is that uh, 1041 Golf Boulevard, uh, that was made in fall. Oh, that's settled. That, that code enforcement that we didn't budge on. Nice job. I do have a question about another <coughs> under construction on Golf Boulevard. Kind of, I don't, I don't know the house number, but it's just been sitting for a well, long period of time. Framing. All the framing. All the framing. Yeah. What's going on there? Is that? Do they kind of get a software order or something? Uh, they, they had to stop because they needed to, some kind of cracking in on this support beam. Um, this guy's name was Street. Uh, the right couple right right. right. behind Mike Kelly's house. So, what would that be like between Shallow and It's uh, between Harrison and Hollow. How are you? Yeah, or Bell Isle. Harrison and Bell Isle. It's right across from the Yeah, it's down that way. Yeah, it's north yeah. of the Yeah, it's yeah. sort of behind the wrong man. Yeah, it was yeah, a cracking right. issue. Um, but they had to bring it. I would call that them. one's further along. The other one's a little They're south. still within their permit time frame, but I'll call the, the contractor to get an update on what's yeah, going on. They've been they... taking care of the grass at least now. Yeah. Um, because that was growing up out of control. And when they build the, the the two that are being built, the sidewalks completely destroyed during construction. Oh, they don't yeah. get any they don't put any like barricades out or any warning. So if someone's riding their bike at night, they would know. You know, just some safety stuff right. that we might need to have them. Okay, anything else? We make a motion so our city attorney can go home and get his birthday. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> ooh, ooh. Before midnight. <laughs> I'll be all right. Next year we'll have a cake. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. All right. Uh, you made a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All right, all in favor? Uh